please hit like and subscribe. It lets me know you're enjoying these videos. Hey guys, welcome to Mars or Bust. I'm Spaceman Dave, and today I have a replay of the Nexus Aurora live stream that aired yesterday. Take a look, then head over to Nexus Aurora YouTube channel and subscribe for all the updates. The details are in the description. Great. Tom. Everything is running smoothly. Right. I'll also share my camera as well. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, Sean, uh, could you already prepare uh, some visuals also in your sort of second screen that we can share once you start talking? Is that uh, maybe a good idea? Uh, okay. I've got. I also have some visuals prepared on the streaming, so if you look ah, at okay. the stream yeah. right now, there are visuals running from all our projects. I think it's safe okay. to start uh, the presentation. That's great. Okay. Uh, thank you, Adrian. So, welcome all um, on this uh, first uh, live stream that we are testing out with uh, Nexus Aurora. Um, we are an uh, open source space colonization uh, team. Um, who's now creating a one million people colony uh, for Mars. Uh, the Mars Society has uh, put out this uh, competition and uh, in about three or four weeks, we have to hand it in. And um, it's a 20 page document and we are working with a large group of people who uh, mostly met on Reddit and are now on a Discord server um, where uh, hundreds of people have actually uh, signed up and helped develop this Mars colony for a million people. Um, today, we will be discussing uh, two main topics, and uh, that's about architecture and city planning. Um, and within these topics, we will talk about uh, basic structural guides, um, atmospheric pressure and the way it influences structures, uh, radiation protection, energy usage, and uh, available materials on Mars to build with. Uh, we have been working uh, for the past month or so with an ever-growing group of people uh, and experts in their own field. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, Sean, um, who's, who joins us from South Africa, uh, Manias Wolf, uh, who will be talking uh, after I'm done, um, has been really on the forefront of the architecture efforts that you can see on your screen right now. Um, and. Uh, I think I will actually give him the word right away. Thank you, Kuhn. Um So the big reason why I want to have this talk um, and why I think it's important is uh, we have a lot of people that come in to, they want to design structures and don't really have a reference to work off because, uh, because all our, all our references for structures for designing really comes from either science fiction or we get our references from earth so we don't actually know how to design on mars and the fact is we've actually never designed structures outside of um, earth really we've designed the international space station humanity's designed the international space station which is a series of tubes but this isn't sufficient for what we need on on mars so we need to have a different approach to how we do this and um well the whole aim of this talk really is to help people that don't know what to do and and want to design but they come with an approach that they're going to do things that they see in science fiction and or even things that they see on earth and maybe just give them a head start so they can actually start uh, designing and things um so the okay so uh, i'm going to be talking about uh, for five different things. And these five things are probably the biggest influences that were 
uh, going to determine what a building looks like on Mars. Um, there are other things as well. There's lots of other things and we can't go through the whole scope of what is design as well because this is a huge topic and it's extremely broad and it involves everything that we're going to do on Mars. But I think these are the first five things that we need to look at. And I think if most people have these covered, we they can actually get started designing things and experimenting. Um, so the first thing I want to look at is the materials we have available on Mars. Um, and we, I mean, the Nexus Aurora, we're going to do things in, in three phases. We, we're going to start off on the approach that phase one is, is essentially going to be bringing everything from Earth. Um, and that means that the materials we use to build need to be light and compact so they can fit in starships. But after that, when people start manufacturing materials on Mars, we're going to, have to start having to look at what's available. And so far, these are kind of the list of the materials that we found available. Um, and well, the first one is the most common one um, is regolith. I'm going to talk about a little bit about water. Um, we have concrete available on Mars. I'm not going to talk a lot about that because we know what concrete is. We know how it works on Earth. but it's important to know that concrete's available. It's very, very available. We also have steel um, available on Mars. I'm not going to talk a lot about that because again, we know what that is, but it is again available. That's very important uh, material. But I want to talk about um, regolith, water, basalt fibers, and polymers because they are extremely important. We don't know these products so well on Earth. So let's quickly jump in. So the materials we have available um, the first material we have available is going to be regolith, and that's probably going to be the first material that Mars people are going to use from Mars itself. It's it. Now, we can do two things with, uh, we actually can do about a couple of things with, with regolith on Mars. The first thing that we can do, which makes a lot of sense, is we can just compact it into bricks and we can make bricks out of it. Uh, and uh, there have already been actual tests done on this with um, a simulator in soils on it. And they found that they can make extremely strong bricks just from compaction because the, the, there's very little water in the soil and there's a lot of high iron content. And when you impact them with the impactor, you can actually get extremely strong uh, blocks very quickly. So this is definitely a material that will be used. Alternatively, you can just uh, uh, load soil on top of each other and compact them directly on top of each other. Uh, if you look at the two bottom images, this is called ramped earth, which we do on earth occasionally. Um, it doesn't make a lot of sense on earth because it's time consuming and we have better things like bricks. But on Mars, it might actually be one of the best uh, ways to build. Um, so it's definitely something we're going to look into. Um, John, can I, uh, yes. before you get to the next material, it might be interesting for people to know two things and that's um, one. Uh, that this regolith uh, actually has a chemical composition that we need to think about. Uh, maybe you can tell something about that, um, just to explain. And one more thing in general about the Nexus Aurora project and the way that we uh, want to create this one million people colony is that we have uh, defined three phases of development of the cities uh, that we want to create to get to one million people on Mars. So we have phase one. Uh, which is uh, by definition that we created ourselves as a group uh, about up to 500 people. So that's really the first phase. Not all production technologies will be available and a lot of the modules that we create will be shipped from Earth. So phase two will be a medium sized city of uh, about 50,000 people uh, or up to that number. Um, and uh, in the final phase three, we will have uh, the million people uh, colony that we uh, need to create. And it's important to mention because uh, some of the technologies we are talking about will be uh, available only in phase three, for example. So we need to really think about the steps that we need to take before we get to this final colony size. That's just one thing I would like to add for our general audience as well. Th thanks, Gunya. That It's actually very important because um, the list I'm talking about, the, the materials, will also essentially be the list, uh, the order in which we'll have materials available because regolith is very easy to work with. And we've looked at um, building a vault, uh, like the one you see on the screen, is actually not that complicated. One machine would be able to build a vault like this. 
um, and those modules that you see below that will be able to be shipped from Earth. This means that the very early Martian colonists will very quickly be able to establish them a environment that is safe from radiation uh, with very little effort, very little energy, uh, and will get them going from phase one. And the similar technology will be used right through to phase three. And it's not that silly because if we look at Earth, we're still building with bricks. After the first bricks were used almost uh, 10,000 years ago, we're still using bricks today. And I'm confident that we're going to be using bricks on Mars as well. Um, it just it makes too much sense to not do brick structures of some kind. Um, there's been a lot of talk. A lot of people want to throw soil directly on top of the habitats. And I'm a little bit opposed to that. Uh, one of the reasons why is if you throw soil on top of a habitat like this, uh, I'm sure if you look at this image here, you just see these little modules and there's nothing happening. But in reality, we'll want to wire them up with electricity. There'll be plumbing. You'll want to be able to walk around. Um, you want rovers, you want a place to put things. And the moment you put soil on top of these, you can't do any of that. Then you're either outside of your building or you're inside, but there's no in-between space. There's no place to service uh, the module. If there's a leak, how do you fix the leak if it's covered in soil? So I'm not convinced we're going to be just throwing soil on top, but I do think we're going to be building brick bolts like this. Um, it's a very easy technology and I'm very, very sure we're going to end up doing that. Um, and your first question, Kun, actually was about the, the, the soil itself. The soil is, has got a lot of salts and Mars uh, soil has got a lot of oxides. Uh, there's a lot of oxygen in the soil and it wants to react with everything. This unfortunately means that it's poisonous to people. So we're not going to have brick structures like this inside habitats. Um, and in fact, it, it brings a important point that I don't think is um, talked about enough, but there's a lot of detail that's going to have to go into the processes that people take to enter into habitats, because they're going to have to go through a cleaning process to remove their suits, they're going to have to remove all the soil. So there's going to be, what you're seeing over here in this image is the idea that people just walk inside, but the reality is there'll probably be a structure or a domed, um, like a tent, where they'll go inside, they'll blow themselves off, and after they've cleaned themselves, then only will they enter the structures to uh, so that they don't actually come in contact with this dust. This dust is very poisonous, and it's probably the most poisonous thing that they'll that every day Martian will experience, more so than radiation and more so than depressurization event cycle. Okay, so uh, I'm going to jump from that onto the next uh, material that almost definitely will be using is water and ice. Um, we're not the first people to have thought about using ice in structures. Ice is very good for radiation protection. The landing site we've chosen has got a lot of water, so we can use water um, and, and freeze it, obviously. Uh, we can also build blocks out of ice and, and build structures. There's a lot of good things that come from ice. One of the best things from it, though, the biggest reason to use it is it's clear. It allows light through. But at the same time, it's very got very strong radiation protection. So the fact that it's a good radiation protection and um, it's clear means that if you had to build brick vaults out of, out of ice, you'd actually have fabulous structures. And this would be really, really good. The disadvantage to ice, obviously, it melts. And um, if it's touching the uh, habitat and the habitats will be warm, it'll melt. The other issue is water subliminates, it, it, it evaporates straight into the atmosphere. So it'll have to be covered in a plastic layer. None of these are big issues, but this is something that people will have to think of. We've, we've had lots of ideas about using ice. Uh, let me see if I can quickly just throw some structures up. Um, so we've had some ideas of throwing quite big buildings um, with big ice folds uh, on Mars. And generally, they, they seem like they'll be very nice structures because you'll be able to go inside of them uh, and have this very big structure with clear lighting all the way inside. The problem is you're going to have to create a separation layer to make sure that the ice stays cool. Um, and then obviously the problem is ice isn't very, doesn't like to be moved around, so it could crack. And if it's your pressure vessel and it cracks, then you've got a big problem. So 
it's not a perfect material, but it is a material that we can use and we can look at it. Um, then, um, basalt fibers. This is, I think, one of the most important materials that we're going to use on Mars. Um, and basalt fibers is good for only one thing. It's very strong in the tensile direction. It's um, it's stronger than steel. It's about four times stronger than steel in the tensile structure. But its most important factor is it's very cheap to make on Mars. Basalt is uh, available. Our landing site has got a lot of basalt available. Um, and with this, we can make pressure vessels because everything in Mars is going to require pressure vessels if we want to live there. And uh, pressure vessels need tensile structures. Uh, I'll go into a little bit of detail into that now but yes this is one of our most important materials we're going to use and we use it on earth at the moment we don't use it all that much because we've got steel and steel is cheap on earth it's actually more expensive on earth than on, uh, but on mars it will be the cheapest material um the last material i really want to talk about and uh, this is, we talk about this a lot, e are the, the different polymers, because polymers have a fairly good tensile uh, strength as well. Nowhere close to basalt fiber or steel, but relatively quite good. It's better than glass, for example. Um, and uh, polymers are also very good for radiation protection, but you still need about half a meter to a meter of it before you get some valuable radiation out of it. You will be able to make polymers on Mars, but they are very expensive. We get on Earth. We get polymers mostly from our oil industry, um, and we've got it's a byproduct from the oil industry, really. And we've got so much plastic available on Earth, and it's almost free. We use it everywhere. But on Mars, this is going to be more expensive than steel. Um, I'll show a bit later in the talk how much more expensive it is. It's it's going to be tremendously expensive to make, unless we find uh, new ways to make it. But it's a essential product because it can seal things. Um, basalt fibers, for example, if you look at that picture on the top right, it's a mesh, but there's no way that it's going to be waterproof, uh, airproof or waterproof, where with polymers, we can actually make a, a, a tight environment. Right. Um, I'm now going to talk. Uh, guys, you must please ask me questions as we go. Um, this this talk is going to be over very quickly if I don't get some feedback. Um, and I don't want to just skip through things if people actually don't know something. Um, and well, Sean, um, uh, it might be interesting for you to know that uh, some questions are being asked uh, on the live stream itself. Uh, we are on Discord with this uh, stream, but uh, on YouTube, this uh, talk is being streamed uh, live or with a maybe 20 second delay. And uh, some of the questions that have been asked uh, are about uh, why we choose to create a, a vault, uh, for example, instead of um, uh, a tunneling system um, and the explanation that I have uh, given in text uh, at least uh, at the live chat of the stream um, is that we are not sure about the lava tube stability which would be a way to uh, create uh, radiation to build below ground uh, and uh, the tunnels um, that we, we really feel they are uh, uncertain uh, to uh, to create on Mars uh, because we don't know the um, below surface uh, conditions and um, because they have not been really mapped uh, yet. Uh, I think even one of the rovers uh, rovers has uh, big problems uh, even putting one uh, small drill into the ground uh, as we speak. Um, and uh, we try to create a, a very realistic uh, design uh, for the one million people colony. Uh, and and we also like people to be happy and uh, we do think people will be happier if they have views and views will be possible if you create above level above surface uh, structures um, with radiation protection of course uh, and we will talk later about specific radiation protection measures um, in this talk i think sean will uh, talk about that uh, as well um yeah well let me quickly discuss that because the the question of why did we go underground comes up a lot and it's it's actually a very very important question um i'm gonna quickly just show a picture on on the screen over here um i'm not sure if you can show this and i, I myself and Kun were talking about this quickly the other day and 
here's a, here's a structure, and I just quickly want to show. This is a vault. Um, and if I had to make this a very thick vault for, let's say that's, that's all radiation protection. That is 117 cubic meters of soil we need to move for every one meter of space we want to create. If I want to create the same structure underground, I have to dig at least double that. And so the first, the first answer to why don't we go underground is underground, you're going to have to move a lot more soil. Um, and to get anything done, you're going to have to move a lot more soil. And we think, ah, oh, that's not a big problem because we've got machines to do that. But you have to ask yourself, um, one, is it, is it the best way to do it? Because if we can do it better in another way, then we're wasting our time doing it in, in a more complicated way. Um, the other problem with tunnels is you can only enter a tunnel in one direction and you can exit the other direction. So if you're building it, you're, you're working on a one dimensional field, which means that the machines are going to get into their way. So the process of building is very, very slow where you can imagine building uh, a vault like this. You can have a machine come from the side. You can have machines come in the middle. In fact, while you build, you can do other things as well. So at the end of the day, you can build a lot of more structure with the same material uh, in the same amount of time, it's, a, it's very quick. The other issue I want to bring up is if I want to look at our Mars site uh, at the moment, so this is where our landing area is going to be. And I'm quickly going to zoom into our lava tubes that we have on site. And this is something that concerned me right from the start. If we look at the lava tubes, the first question we ask is how do we know the lava tubes on Mars? And the answer is because we see collapsed lava tubes. Now, collapsed lava tubes is actually not what we want to see because it collapsed lava tubes mean that they're unstable. Um, and there's nothing that, to me that says that we are going to go to Mars and we're going to find these magnificent giant holes free and we're going to walk into them and have these radiation protection areas. It's possible that we find protected lava tubes, but it's not something we can plan for at the moment. So. Right now, all we know is we've got collapsed lava tubes, but we don't know if we have good lava tubes. So we can't plan for the unknown. Um, Kun, I don't know if that answers the, the question well enough. Uh, yes, it does. Uh, I hope you can see me uh, putting my thumb up, but uh, yes, great answer. Thank you. Um, I'm also running through Discord. I see there's a couple of questions people ask. Um, there's a question. Uh, for from uh, Ignis is he asked, can we use bioplastics? Um, and don't we need plastic to shield from radiation? We can use bioplastics, and this is something we're looking at. Bioplastics would be um, using algae that we can grow on Mars, um, using uh, special incubators, and from that we can make plastics. Um, my early calculations were yes, we can. Uh, bioplastics would be more beneficial to make than using um, the ISRU system, um, the saboteur reaction that uh, they want to use to make methane. In fact, once we have enough space, it'll be cheaper and easier to make methane on Mars using um, algae than it would be to use um, uh, the saboteur process. Um, but that we can only do a bit later on, and it will still be a fairly slow process. A lot, I mean, a lot, lot slower than moving soil around. So it's, it actually becomes more viable of an option later on, phase three, but still not at the quantities of steel or at the quantities of, say, basalt. Um, so it'll still be a fairly expensive part. Um, I just want to quickly read through the other questions. Uh, Oh, yes. And don't we need plastic to shield from radiation? Yes, they are there. But it's again, the question of um, we don't have that much plastics available to provide the sufficient shielding. Um, I'll, but I'm going to talk about shielding in a minute. Uh, then we can go into more depth about that because I want to explain some concepts, which I think a lot of people don't fully understand. So um, uh, let me get into that in a second. The topic I actually want to talk about now first, before we get to the other ones is a topic that a lot of people underappreciate, and that is the pressure that we're sitting with and the pressure differences that we sit with. Um, 
On Mars, we've got next to no atmosphere. We've got about 1% of Earth's atmosphere. And um, we want to live in an in a atmosphere, or we're designing habitats for, for Earth's atmosphere, which is about 100 uh, kilopascals. Um, that is a good 100 times higher than, than Mars's pressure. And the difference is we think about uh, one bar is one, one, 101 kilopascals. We think that it's the same as a car tire pressure on Earth. So a car tire on Earth is two bar, and we think, ah, oh, it's, only, it's only a little bit higher. But in fact, it's not because Mars has got no pressure. So the difference between our pressure, we're already sitting at one bar of pressure, and a car tire two bar, it's twice as much pressure, uh, or three times as much because it's two bar inside and one bar outside. So it's three times. On Mars, though, you've got one or 10 kilo, kilopascals, sorry, not 10, six, uh, 600 pascals. So about one kilopascal of pressure on Mars. And uh, we want 100 kilopascals outside. There's a 100 times difference between inside and outside. What that means is that the outside walls from a habitat will be pushing at about 37 tons per meter squared. Now that's a lot. So the structures will have to be very, very strong. If you put 37 tons per meter square of soil on top of a structure, it will not dent in. I don't know how many whales that is, but that's a lot of whales per square meter. And we're not easily going to dent a structure. So that's my other problem. A lot of people ask, why don't we inflate uh, like a balloon inside a cave? Because you need to be at least 14 or 15 meters below the ground to balance out the weight of the soil on top of you. If you're higher than that, and there's only 10 meters of soil, your pressure vessel is going to just pop up and explode. Um, so there's a lot of pressure inside, and this is a very big underappreciated thing. Um, these are some images we've shown before, and some problems and just mistakes people make in designing. Uh, the two images on the left are not things that you can do on Mars. Any structure with flat walls will want to turn round because you need a lot of steel to, to balance out those forces uh, to get a straight shape. So the shapes will want to be round and designing round structures will just be so much easier uh, on Mars. The other issue is domes can't have flat bottoms. What's going to happen if that dome on the bottom left is the minute you put pressure on it, it's going to shoot upwards. Now you can say, fine, let's, I'm going to make my dome very heavy, but that dome needs to, again, weigh more than 37, let's about 40 tons per meter square. And you'll find that that dome becomes extremely thick. That is um, about 40 meters of water on top, or uh, it's about 15 meters of steel. It's, it's incredibly thick. Right. So, I mean, yeah, yeah there's a photo on the top left of what everybody thinks it's going to look like in the picture on the bottom left is what it's going to end up looking like. All these domes are going to shoot off. The, um, so there are some solutions. We can try and solve it. We can put a steel thing or a very strong structure on top of a dome and dig it very deep underground and tie it with uh, anchors. But it, it's going to be big. It's not going to be a, a lightweight little structure. Um, and the other one is just build a round sphere and, and let your structure go into the ground. So you won't see the bottom. Maybe you put soil or something in there, but you can then have a dome. Um, I'm just quickly answering some questions uh, from JC Denton. Could you use fungi as the building material? Oh, that's interesting. I don't know too much about fungi. Um, I do know that people have experimented with fungi as a um, material, but it, I don't know what tensile strength it is. And as, as I'm discussing now, tensile strength really becomes the, the overarching factor that determines um, when you can hold things in. But we can maybe use fungi in other different ways. We could, if fungus is useful to, be, to grow and then to be converted into something else, um, such as a, a bioplastic or something, then definitely it'll be very useful. Um, there's a lot of things on Mars um, that fungi could or could maybe break down uh, to remove the toxins, and in the process we can we can recycle the fungus into other materials. If we can find something like that, that'll be very important. Uh, it'll be quite good. Um, right. Uh, okay. So let me let me carry on. Uh, the next 
issue I want to talk about is, uh, this is something people forget about it as well. The bigger the radius, the thicker the side walls need to hold the same pressure. Uh, if you look at that picture on the right, that's a, that's a 300 bar cylinder. And that hose on this, that comes out on the side can also hold 300 bars of pressure. Now, if you look at the cylinder, you'll see that it's uh, made from material called carbon fiber overwrap. And inside of that is uh, aluminum. And you'll probably find with all this fancy carbon fiber and aluminum, it's still a couple of centimeters thick to hold in 300 bars of pressure. That's a lot of pressure that needs to hold in. That same tube is actually very thin. It doesn't have all these fancy things. Why is that? Well, if you think about my example I gave previously that uh, the pressure pushes out at 37 tons per square meter, you'll realize that if you re reduce that surface area, you reduce how much pressure it's pushing out. This means that a small structure with a small radius can hold, uh, can be a lot weaker than a big structure. And at the bottom of this little Excel, I showed the little um, graph over here, but to give you an example, two millimeters of steel, um, will easily be able to hold in three meter radius structure at uh, these these figures of five times atmospheric pressure so it's it's a lot higher than you normally would because uh, we have to design some safety factoring but two millimeters of steel will be able to hold the three meter radius structure quite easily without too much issues um but uh you see what happens when you've got a bigger uh Sorry, you're gonna to have to ignore these figures. I've actually made a little bit of a mistake because these other figures, the 75 and the 7.5 are for lower pressures. But um, if you go seven millimeters of steel can then hold 10 meter radius structure. And you need to go quite large, uh, about 10 millimeters of steel to hold 150 meter radius. So you're, you need a lot thicker material to hold, um, to hold uh, bigger radius as a bigger dome. So, what will happen if you have these big domes, especially like the ones we see over here, they'll need really, really strong materials. Um, oh, sorry, uh, May has mentioned that the Martian regolith would undergo chemical reaction with any organic material. Yes, that's that's another issue is um, bioplastics will, will be <laughs> reactive to the Martian soil. Um, as, as May Elizabeth has made clear a few times, the Martian soil is highly reactive. It's, um, it's, it's all, uh, I think she explained the other day that if we had to use aluminum with uh, um, the Martian soil, it would explode. So it's, it's not a joke. Uh, the Martian soil is going to want to kill us more than anything else on Mars. Um, okay, so that's, that's the basic principles. Um, I just want to quickly give an idea of um, how we can fix these to make interesting structures. So, Sean, uh, before you uh, continue, um, yeah. it would be interesting to explain, uh, maybe by going two slides back as well, uh, why uh, the structures people will see are also below ground, uh, uh, circular below, below ground. Because if you go back uh, one or two slides more, you also saw this, yeah, that, the, that one, thank you. Uh, you see like a flattened bottom, but in practice, in our designs, we create a, a curved uh, surface all the way through the soil, actually. So we need to excavate that. Can you maybe explain why we do that? Okay. Um, so if, if you look at the, the structure on the bottom left, and this is the, this is the typical image we see on these domes on the top, top left over here, these beautiful flat bottom domes with forests and trees and they, they're amazing but and everybody wants to build them. The problem is pressures, if you look at the bottom right picture, the pressure wants to push on every single surface and the ground is a surface as well. And what's going to happen is we think, okay, fine, the ground's not going to move. Uh, so, so you can push on the ground as much as possible. But, but what's going to happen is the dome's going to move. So your structure is going to shoot up. It's, it's actually going to lift up and it needs to be incredibly, incredibly heavy for it not to lift up. So essentially you need to look at the internal pressures as there's an explosion that's happening inside that wants to get out. And if you give it any escape, it's going to get out and it's going to lift off. Um, there, uh, yeah, it's, it's just going to, it's going to lift off and there's very little you're going to want to do. So let me just go back. Yeah, it's going to, you're going to have to 
put 37 tons per square meter on your structure. Otherwise, it's going to fly off into the sky and it's going to end back into orbit. Okay. Um, yeah, could please, if, if more people ask questions on the, the live stream, let me know. I don't have it in front of me. I've got, I've got yes, uh, some, some of the questions uh, are being answered uh, as you speak. Um, one of the questions uh, was, oh, can I see, um, about uh, uh, the steps and phases that we make and uh, if we bring all of the modules that we are thinking about uh, for phase one, if we bring them from, from Earth, um, and I've responded that yes, uh, for phase one, um, uh, almost all habitats will be brought uh, from Earth. Um, I'm not sure, Sean, if you will show something about that, but uh, just so you guys know uh, that uh, I will be sharing also a link uh, to another video that we have uh, created uh, of some of the basic design ideas for these modules, which are six meter in diameter and have two floors inside of them and are a pressure vessel in the same way that uh, Sean is talking about. And they will be used uh, above ground with radiation shielding created above that. Um, and uh, I will share a link to an example of that uh, in uh, the chat uh, in the live stream on YouTube. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Gun. Um, yeah, the, the modules are very important because uh, even, even even the compressed blocks, you don't want to get onto Mars with too much work for the first habitat habitants. Um, they want to get there and know that things are, are working for them. Um, and you know, we, we used to building things on Earth, building building a brick vault is a piece of cake on Earth. Um, I'm going to bring this image to bring it, building this on Earth is is easy. I mean, we've we've got amazing things, but we don't know what's going to happen on Mars. We don't know how comp it's going to be because we've got low gravity. We think, oh, that's great, but maybe handling tools will be more difficult. Um, what's interesting is the very first International Space Station, the very first EVAs. Uh, that they did, uh, sorry, before the International Space Station even, when they tried to to build things outside of space stations, they very quickly realized that tools that were meant for use on Earth did not work in space because you've got thick gloves and you've got internal pressure because all your suits will have thick uh, pressure inside. So your fingers will be pushing out and you won't be able to do the things on Mars surface. And it'll take some practice. It'll take some training before building a simple thing like this will be possible. Um, as well as simple things like welding on Mars, we're not going to get there with welders and start welding. It's going to we're going to have to learn from from scratch how to do these things, uh, and these will all be a challenge. So we we presume we know we're fairly confident that they'll be able to solve them eventually. But on phase one, we're going to have to to make things very easy for the colonists. That's why we are suggesting modules similar to the ones I'm showing now. Um, I wonder if I've got an uh, image of some more modules I can give that we've designed myself with Kun and a few others that we've um, just to just to get it easy for the for the people on Mars when they get there. Uh, let me quickly see if I can get a nice uh, image of some modules. There's also a running uh, slideshow on the live stream right now. Some of these modules have been presented, but yes, this is new picture, so I will. Uh... Showcase it. Yeah, so this is this is kind of the modules, and I quickly want to talk about these. So what we've designed is we've got a couple of different types of doors, and this is this door, for example, has uh, two. We we haven't decided if they're all going to look like this, but they can be rotated down uh, so that you've got doors at the bottom, and we can ship. A dome like this, just this component over here, we can ship almost directly from Mars, uh, from uh, from Earth. And right in the beginning, it'll probably look similar to that. But later on, they can weld the doors on um, once they've figured that out. And they can start assembling these modules. And a module like this would have parts that can that are modular that can add more or less. So they can build them as big as they want. If they want a really long module, they can have that for different needs. Um, and this is what we, which we presume that they'll have uh, for the first few phases um, with various options on module doors. Um, and these, these will give the Martians quite a few options and uh, they'll be able to be on multiple levels, for example, as well. So 
So there's already quite a bit of work we've done in the interior of these um, modules to figure them out and how they work. Uh, a lot of details gone into them so far, um, but I think it would be nice if we can get some more help with these because we, we've got some renders and I'll show some images of what we've done in the interior of these. But um, yeah, these, these I think are amazing structures and we'll probably be using them throughout uh, the, whole, the, the whole Mars colony. Um, I've just got a question here from Ignis. Can we separate internal chambers? Um, the life protocol requires that. Um, yes, we can separate uh, in, internal chambers. Um, uh, and there's lots of different ways in which we can which we can separate different chambers and things. Um, and Kuhn's done some really really nice designs, uh, which I'll maybe show one of the ideas that he's that he's done in terms of having a city in multiple different chambers and, and layouts, uh, which which is actually quite exciting in this way because we have to remember we're building a city for a million people, so. We can't do that with just things like this. The modules aren't going to be enough. Uh, so we have to. Uh, so, Sean, um, what, what, what might also be interesting for people to understand uh, is that uh, these outposts, which will be, or sorry, these modules uh, are six meters in diameter, and the, the length can vary, as you say, uh, but they can also be repurposed and sort of reused or recycled, whatever you want to call it. Because one of the basic staples that we have in the whole project is that uh, nothing will go to waste. So um, even though these are uh, kind of small habitats, if you are thinking about a one million city uh, or a one million people colony, uh, the interesting thing is that uh, we will maybe even in this talk explain um, about the fact that we will spread out to, for example, create mining outposts and research outposts and do scientific research at specific places uh, which are not con connected directly uh, to the city. So you have to go there by uh, rover or a, a different way uh, or by rail, uh, which is also a group uh, is working on a rail system, even on Mars. And um, the idea is that after the main city and the main landing site uh, create, uh, has, has a big enough city and we get to phase two of the colonization plan, so we are 500 people plus, we will be using these modules as the start of new smaller cities or outposts. So we, we, are, we are not going to throw them away and we're also not going to bury them below ground for this reason too. Uh, it's also maybe interesting to mention because you have to dig them up as well. Um, so a vault like Sean has described uh, is also uh, a nice thing uh, that you can uh, easily disassemble uh, these modules or uh, they're stiff enough uh, to be, uh, yeah, to be transported whole uh, even. And the railroads uh, are also um, going to be at the right size, so we could do that. Yeah, here's an example um, uh, that I made a, a while back, a, a rough sketch um, of what uh, you could also do with these modules. Um, because 500 people uh, creating housing for them, you would get like maybe the Antarctic uh, McMurdo Station of America. That's a similar size. Um, and uh, also very isolated, of course. And you see that we create with the basic elements of these modules, we can create many different shapes. They are connected. And uh, as, you have, as you can see now uh, in the bottom right, you see a sort of an airlock uh, kind of situation uh, where an astronaut uh, could uh, step, uh, in this case, uh, because it's an old render inside of uh, a lava tube. Uh, which provides the radiation in this case, uh, but uh, we can find different solutions for that, uh, creating vaults uh, with compressed regolith, uh, for example. And while I'm talking, I would like to also answer a question that was asked uh, in the stream uh, by uh, Mars Rover. Uh, I, maybe it's the real Mars Rover, uh, that would be nice. Uh, how involved is re robotics in your plan? And uh, one of the important things that we have done in the last week is really focus also on creating a, a comprehensive list of all the robotics that we will need on Mars to create a colony. Um, just to give you an example, if we would like to create this vault, uh, it could be done mostly by robots, if not completely by ro robots. Uh, so you need to create uh, some kind of a digging machine or an excavator to get the soil uh, and then you need to compress this soil 
Um, and when you have kind of bricks uh, that we also have defined, what kind of sizes do you want and uh, how, uh, what do they need to look like? Um, then you can get, for example, what Sean is showing here is one of his concepts of uh, a very basic robot arm, uh, which is actually sort of a conveyor belt, which also supports the arch structure so it does not collapse. So you can create a vault this way. Um, and uh, yeah, these kinds of basic robotics help uh, in uh, creating uh, even radiation protection before people even arrive on Mars. So that is a possibility. The further we go on, uh, when we get to maybe uh, 50,000 people on Mars, phase two, for example, we will have much more robotics uh, available to us. Um, that's a very specific subject that we will not uh, cover too much uh, right here and right now, but uh, there might be a live stream in the future specifically about this, uh, because uh, I imagine a lot of people are interested in uh, what we come up with. Yeah, thanks, Kul. Um, okay, I just want to go to, yes, I want to quickly just show uh, back to the pressure vessels, just quickly an idea of, of how to make pressure vessels look more exciting. Um, the big problem with pressure vessels is because they want to push out. Uh, if we want to make big structures, we we want to merge cylinders together. Um, what we do is we build uh, these girders on top and bottom of, of structures, like a farm. This would be a farm structure. And you actually pull the, the girders together. Um, and actually, you know what the best thing for me to do as well is to show the simplest thing out uh is an air mattress because this is the air mattress is the the thing that we're going to essentially be building on mars um <laughs> sorry this is this is a silly little picture of air mattress but if you had a look at these uh yeah um if you had a look at any air mattress they are very big flat structures and the nice thing about flat structures is they're efficient with the material because we only need the bottom part. We don't need this, all the space on top. And the ratio of material per usable floor space is maximized on a structure like this. So this is kind of what we're aiming for for large structures when we're talking about housing thousands of people. Um, domes, domes will not be able to do what structures like this will do. Uh, Kun, I'm going to quickly ask you if you can just pop me one of your images. I don't have one readily available, then I can also maybe show it all. Um, and uh, oh, actually, yeah, so a, a, a mattress is essentially the best way to do. And if you look at this is essentially what we're doing over there is we're combining these structures, we're pulling them together and to make this giant air mattress and then we can get a lot of let me just quickly show as well what i've done on the 3d and this is essentially how big you can make it you can go as long as you want um, you can go for a kilometer long structure which is what i've done uh, this is also one of kun's designs that he's managed to to do um, and that's that's actually very uh, very useful. Uh, I'm quickly going to pull out what I've done to help us with that as well, uh, just to show the kind of kind of thinking that we're busy with. Sorry, I just have to pull this program up. I didn't expect to have to open every single program on my computer today, but it looks like uh, that's that's what I have to do. Um, so these are essentially very similar to what uh, Kuna showed over here. Um, and what it is, is it's exactly an air mattress. It's a section of it. And we can actually combine these uh, together to make a very large structure. Now, what I've done is, uh, let me quickly show you what I've done here. So what I've done is we've, I've created a, the ability for us to do this quickly for Mars. So we can design lots of different structures with different radiuses. This is a, a 16 radius structure, which ooh, obviously I must make it too big, too small. And these are different shapes and we can then do all kinds of different shape um, and size of this. And this is 
in the sense how I want to get a large part of the city done so that we can say, okay, fine, inside of these structures, we can then put lots of different buildings. Uh, let me just, we can put lots of different buildings inside where you'll, for example, see the red part is where the buildings are and the clear part would be this air mattress structure. So we combine them together and we create a massive city quite easily with minimal use of material. What we'd have to do on top though, and I'm going to talk about that just now, is to put water on top to create radiation protection. And on top of that will be a small, uh, another tent, which will hold less pressure in. Um, and that will help us um, uh, keep the water from subliminating. So yes, this is the kind of structures that we're thinking about at the moment in terms of housing a lot of people. Um, so I just want to see Ignis asked another question. I assume we will be using the air mattress technique of adding supportive pillars to prevent the mattress from circulating. Um, yes, uh, so Kun's uh, picture over here, you, where my mouse is over here, I'm not sure if you can see it. There's nothing in between there. But there will be uh, during the actual structure, and these structures will look more like this, where you've got the support tension structures pulling inwards, and these structures, so you'll have these structures pulling inwards, and there's this beam that supports the pressure inwards. Otherwise, everything's going to want to go round. So these structures will all need this beam, and then we can have these giant structures. So that's kind of what we, we what we're planning on doing uh, for uh, for most of the Mars uh, structures as well. And there's a lot of different ways to do this, and there's a lot of different ways in which we can uh, lay this out. Uh, so we've got a lot of options. We're we're not stuck to just these round um, cylinders. We're also not stuck to uh, to just the modules. We can do quite a lot. Um, before I move on to radiation, is there any other questions that other people are asking that I can maybe uh, go into? Yes, uh, yes, uh, Sean. I think uh, one interesting question would be, uh, would it be realistic or, or feasible to have lots of windows, small and big, uh, and glass domes, uh, considering radiation, wind, dust, or meteors? And that's a question asked by Stefan Cowrie. Okay, well, I think this is a good time to move on to the topic of radiation then, because um, radiation is probably one of the things we understand the least, because um, we don't deal with this so much on Earth. We don't have to. Um, we, the only time we deal with it is in hospitals with x-rays, CT scans. Um, we hear some stuff about Fukushima and these things, but these don't really affect our lives very much. So I've done a little bit of research. I just want to say I'm not an expert at the topic and it is an extremely complicated topic. Um, but I've done some research and I can give you the simplest explanation of what radiation is and how it will affect people on Mars and then how to answer that question in terms of windows. So the first thing is Radiation on Mars is not a dead sentence. Uh, we're not sitting with a situation where you walk outside and you're a frizzled raisin 20 seconds later from all the radiation. Um, to, give, to give some perspective, um, the average person, I'm going to just read out what I've wrote, written over here. The average dose of radiation on Earth is about three, these are millisieverts a year. Um, that measurement is many sieverts, and there's many ways to, to measure radiation dosage, but uh, let's just talk about this. Um, but it ranges from between 3 and 50, depends on where you are on Earth. Now, if you had to take a CAT scan, it, it will be a 7 milli CV to a year. Uh, or sorry, not CV, not in a year, once off. That's a once off dosage of 7. So if you had a one CAT scan in a year, you'll probably have about 10 milli sieverts for that particular year. That will be your dosage. If you spend a year on the International Space Station, you'll receive about 400 millisieverts a year, which is a tremendous amount above 3 millisieverts a year. Um, and a trip to Mars will take, give you about 700 millisieverts. Now, a trip to Mars will take about, uh, this is worked off for six months, but if you see that 700 is much higher than 400 for the International Space Station, an international space station is 
lower because it is protected in Earth's magnetic field, which removes a lot of the radiation um, from the sun. Now, on Mars, obviously, we don't have that benefit. So people on Mars will be uh, get direct exposure from not just the sun, but also the galactic cosmic background radiation. So I don't know, and I don't know how much research has been done this, and I haven't found it, if it is there. I don't know how much radiation we have to worry about of the sun versus the background cosmic radiation, because at night, when there's no sun, you still receive radiation from the cosmic background radiation. Now, the sun does make things a bit difficult, because sometimes it'll give us more radiation, other times it'll be less. Um, However, what we should aim for, for people who live on Mars, is 50 milli CV to year. Um, and this is a safe level. We know this is a safe level. Um, and this is what the, this is standards that have created around the world for people who work in nuclear reactors. And people in nuclear reactors never get more than that, unless there's a mishap of some kind. Sean, uh, now, just to add to, add to that, uh, because I think even, um, I read that uh, 200 millisieverts is actually what people in nuclear reactors uh, may uh, receive at a maximum a year. Uh, one, one, th not too important, but uh, uh, it's it's a it's a nice number. But it would also be interesting to explain uh, that we have um, uh, we will create um, different types of radiation protection, different levels. Uh, and specifically uh, uh, thinking about uh, the places that you spend most time. So, um, uh, and also, could you maybe explain a bit about uh, the trip itself, which might take six months and will maybe be the most dangerous part of the trip in terms of radiation? Yeah, definitely. So, um, the first thing we need to remember is this, these numbers I'm calling out now. What really matters is you need to keep the dosage, the average dosage low to reduce your chances of other things happening like cancer. You could, for example, in your daily life, get 100 millisieverts of radiation once off, and then for the, other, for, for the rest of your, your day, your body heals the damage that the radiation has done. Um, maybe I just quickly talk about what radiation is, because this, this is the part that confuses people a lot. Um, first, there's a difference between things that are radioactive and radiation, because a lot of the I've had the questions of can the radiation from the sun make our crops radioactive, for example, uh, our food that's that's exposed. And the answer is no, we can't make things radioactive because uh, things that are radioactive are, are things that are currently decaying. So the atoms that are busy splitting up, like this picture on the right hand side. Uh, and there's a lot of things that do that. On Earth, we got we're breathing in argon, which which consistently decays into other elements. And that these are things that are radioactive, these things that are actively decaying. When they decay, they emit, uh, and there's other ways to emit uh, radioactive particles as well. Um, I was I was informed that uh, I was informed that the sun gives off uh, gamma radiation, um, and there are different forms of radiation. There's a lot of the, the big issue is your heavier particles like neutrons and even hydrogen atoms that can be ejected at, sub, at, at almost near light speed. And these things happen all around the universe in black holes and supernovas. And these particles are flying all over the place. So they actually, what that happens is when they hit you, they cause damage to your cells uh, and to your DNA. And that's actually where the big problem is because it increases your life, your likelihood of developing cancer. Um, this is what skin cancer does, is uh, you, your, the radiation from the sun will actually knock out parts of your DNA and your DNA will then start uh, uncontrollable growth and things like that. This can also do actual physical cell damage. And provided your body heals properly and you don't have too much of this, you should be fine. There's, there are safe levels of radiation. Um, I worked out if you spend five hours a day on Mars, unshielded outside you will be fine you will be under 50 millisieverts as kun said um the the nuclear reactor workers they can go up to 200 sieverts a day but for 50 millisieverts which is a, we, a known safe level if you spend five hours outside a day you'll be fine so our approach here is not to create a, a situation where we block all radiation 
uh, it's not possible and it's going to be uncomfortable. We want to create a situation where the average person's radiation levels stay very low, below the 50 millisieverts a year, which means that um, transat uh, colonists will have to wear uh, Geiger counters to, to measure what the dosage is throughout the year. And it also means that you don't need to um, shield structures 100%. So we can have windows, um, but the, the goal is obviously to keep the other 20 hours shielded so that when you want to, you can go outside with, without risking yourself. Um, I read a, a paper from about Curiosity Rover that was been measuring radiation as it travels. Um, this image that I've got on the left-hand side here, um, so I didn't see is my screen still displaying properly, Oh, yes, it is. Um, this picture on the left hand side here, yeah, I've got uh, these four markers, A, B, C, and D. Uh, and this is, I took from Curiosity Rover. The problem, uh, I just want to say before I go into this, there's a lot of information that nobody knows yet because we, we as a human race haven't really dealt with radiation to this degree so much. But what they found with Curiosity Rover is when it was out in the open on a field where it would be point A, it got the most radiation. That would be, say, 250 millisieverts um, a day equivalent dose. But as soon as it went next to hills and cliffs, the level of radiation would go down. So point C, we'd see the level of radiation would go down. And just being on the surface, like um, the, when you fly to Mars, the reason why you got so much radiation is because you've got radiation coming from all directions the whole time. The second you land on Mars, the planet covers you half of your horizon. So half of the radiation is gone. And they actually found out it's more than half, it's 2.5 times because the atmosphere also reduces some radiation. So the atmosphere does have an effect and this also helps. So just being on the surface of Mars already halves the problem. Then every time you add a heavy structure close to you and around you, you improve the situation as well. Um, if I look at some of these monument buildings that we designed, having an open space, a gap like this point B where you're inside a valley, it'll make a massive difference. And you could probably be inside a structure like, like these on the right hand side that are open. If you're inside and you're covered, 80% of your space is covered, you'll be fine. Yeah, and you'll be able to live quite happily. Um, so all structures like this are, are possible. Uh, we don't have to hide under caves uh, and fear radiation that much. We just need to be intelligent about it. What will also be necessary on Mars is uh, a weather forecasting for radiation. So obviously we don't have rain or snow or things like that. We might have snow actually, but we won't have rain on Mars, but we need to watch radiation levels because um, we've got solar maximums where the sun emits a lot more radiation, can emit almost a hundred times more radiation. And those days you do not want to be outside. Um, and as long as we're monitoring that and people have active awareness, I don't think we'd have a big problem. About a meter of water would be sufficient to, to stop most radiation and about half a meter, or oh, sorry, about four meters of regolith because water is better at stopping radiation. Uh, about four meters of regolith should do the trick as well. Um, this picture on the bottom right is uh, one of the designs that we've worked on where and we, we, a lot of the designs will have a similar kind of concept. We would pack water on top uh, for radiation protection. And that is great because it means that you can have uh, sunlight coming through and you can have a light structure inside with radiation uh, on top. And maybe I should get a bigger picture of this one on the right as well. Um, because what's useful in that structure as well is we can, we can then also have uh, windows. Because again, if, we're not, if we don't fear Radiation, it means that we can have uh, windows, like if you see there on the, on the left, there's, there's tubes coming out through the side. Um, and it means people can walk to the side and see outside. Um, you don't want to spend your whole day, every day on the window because you can get more radiation there. But again, it's just a matter of a measured approach. Uh, uh, Sean, uh, before you continue uh, about this image specifically, um, can you uh, tell the people what uh, the scale of this is? So what's the diameter of one of these tubes? And, and is it true uh, that, uh, no, it's not a question I know actually. I would just like to add uh, that, one, uh, that our main landing site is 
uh, over five kilometers, I think, or four and a half kilometers uh, below uh, the the mean, uh, the average uh, elevation uh, of Mars. So it's pretty uh, deep down uh, in uh, Hellas Planitia. And that means that we have a lot of more of uh, atmosphere above us. And that also protects us a little bit extra uh, from radiation. I just wanted to add that. Uh, yes, if you give me a second, I can actually show uh, images that they've that they've already taken from um, from that to actually show how that varies. Um, I don't know if this is very clear, but yeah, it actually shows you the difference the the atmosphere makes on Mars. The highest points we will definitely experience, um, and that's like on top of Mount Olympus and on the high altitude areas, which are four kilometers above our level, um, they will receive the highest amount of radiation. Down at the bottom of the valleys, where we are, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer, but we are about here, we're in that green area. So we'll receive about, uh, already about 25, 30% less radiation than the top of the mountains. And at the deepest canyons on Mars, you get, can get about half as much radiation. Um, if you remember, I said uh, Curiosity rover discovered that they, the amount of, of radiation they received on Mars wasn't half as much, but it was 2.5 times less. Um, and that's because of uh, the atmosphere, and that makes a big difference. Um, uh, does that, I think, answer all the questions there, Quinn? Oh, uh, yes, right. yes, yes, it does. Uh, but, uh, the only thing is about the, the, the diameter uh, of these tubes, and I think it was about 24 meters or so. Um, so, okay, well, this this structure, I can quickly give you an idea. The, the radius of one of these tubes is 9.8 meters, um, which works out, and I, I've worked it out in terms of steel thickness. So the steel thickness will be 7 millimeters, um, and it should support the, the, the structure quite well. Um, the distance between the columns, oh, I can't remember now, I think it's about 18 meters, or it'll be, no, it'll have to be less than 18 meters, about, say, 15 meters or so. I can't remember offhand now. Um, but the walls are all very thick. Um, they, these walls are about five, six meters thick. Uh, there's no way radiation is going to get through there. Um, and on top, we've got a thick layer of water. Now. This definitely gives us radiation protection. In fact, inside here, I'm fairly convinced you'll get less radiation inside there than you would on Earth on a normal Earth day. Additionally, this provides a lot of meteorite protection as well. This thing is a bomb shelter. So these are quite safe structures. And this is, I think, generally the approach we're going to have on Mars is people are going to live on bomb structures. And as designers, we need to think about what are the nicest bomb shelters we can design. Um, and this it needs to be a safe environment but it needs to be a pleasant environment we want to live in a nice place um and can so i add, I uh, add uh, sean uh, to this uh, which which might also be interesting for people to know that um as you said uh, light can pass through uh, but also one of the ideas that we are uh, finding out right now with uh, the food production group the farming group is that uh, we could actually uh, farm fish in this water as well Yes, that's Kun, you've done a lot of work on this. Um, and that's actually quite, quite fabulous because uh, uh, protein, obviously food is a big issue. And if we wanted to, if we've got food, if we've got half our calories or fish, we obviously half the amount of farmland we need, or not quite, but very close to half the amount of farmland we need. And um, if we're already building these structures. We need the water for radiation proofing, and it's a benefit in terms of, of aesthetics. So, I can add a little bit uh, to that, uh, maybe, Sean, so that we can finish that specific subject uh, after that, uh, also looking at the time. Um, yeah. So specifically, uh, exactly as Sean said, we we could uh, dig down very deep underground. It's, it's, it is maybe possible. We're not sure yet. That's why we don't do it. But also because we want to create a beautiful environment to live in. You have to get people to be interested to move to Mars. These kinds of structures, uh, which uh, will make you feel like you are living uh, underwater, actually, because above you in the transparent um, uh, polymers, um, which will be reinforced with uh, basalt fibers to be able to uh, cope with all the tension, 
uh, there will be liquid water. And this liquid water will be found uh, mainly on glaciers and uh, uh, underneath the surface. Um, and that's actually why we specifically chose our landing site on the east side of the Hellas Planitia uh, impact crater, actually. Uh, there are a few very large uh, glaciers uh, uh, within a kilometer distance of our first landing site at the beginning of our city. And um, some of the power generation that we will do on, uh, that we need on Mars uh, will actually have a problem of cooling. Uh, on Earth, uh, it's easier to cool. Uh, for example, if you would have a nuclear reactor, you can use uh, water from a river, just uh, to give an example. Uh, but there are no rivers on Mars. Actually, we need to create this water from solid uh, water ice. Uh, and that's a very important resource, uh, resource as you would understand. And uh, the glaciers uh, could provide a sort of cooling and uh, also this cooling uh, of uh, power generation, uh, also maybe solar, um, would actually provide us with uh, this liquid water. The liquid water could be used for all things, uh, of course, for farming and drinking water, showering and all of that. Uh, but also large quantities uh, should be used for radiation protection because uh, the hydrogen atoms, uh, as I have been told, uh, are one of the best uh, ways to have um, the thinnest layer of radiation protection, um, um, but uh, still have the best amount of radiation protection. And uh, you would actually, if we do our work correctly, uh, create structures that will give you uh, less radiation on Mars um, uh, while you feel outside, because all of this light is shining through this kind of lake or ocean above you, filled with fish even. And these kinds of interesting things are, uh, are things that we are realizing uh, in our uh, uh, designs. And it's and a lot of these things are so very counterintuitive uh, that is one of the things that I really like about uh, uh, working on the Nexus Aurora project. Um, and I would also like to imagine, uh, mention, while we are uh, at least uh, halfway through the stream now, um, that uh, this is an open source project. And a lot of people from all different kinds of discipline disciplines uh, really can uh, contribute to this. And uh, some people uh, are very into um, chemistry, other people are into uh, biology, and uh, other people are into robotics, engineering, all of these kinds of disciplines um, provide uh, opportunity for you to actually contribute to this project and to making life uh, multiplanetary. Uh, and uh, yeah, this open source uh, project, uh, you, can, you can join as well. Um, and uh, the best thing to do was, uh, would be to start at uh, Reddit, at uh, our at Nexus Aurora subreddit, and uh, also maybe send a message to uh, Adrian, who is uh, also in this uh, stream, uh, one of the first uh, people who really started the whole project. And um, uh, he's a space instructor on Reddit, and uh, he can uh, send you an invite if you have some ideas and con contributions, uh, and then you can join the Discord server which we are having this talk on uh, right now. So uh, I would like to give the word back to you, uh, Sean. Also, make a uh, small uh, intercut from me. So <laughs> speaking of the community, there are a lot more projects, not just the building uh, project, but there are like several domains. Uh, one of them derived being the urban planning, and then we have uh, utilities. We are also concerning ourselves with the economics aspects. Basically, we try to figure out the entire question, not just part of it, that part that looks pretty. Now, still talking about the buildings, I think it's worth mentioning that we have this uh, ongoing project to create a VR, virtual reality simulation of the entire uh, Nexus Aurora colony. So we are already uh, exploring uh, Unity uh, as a game engine and we are trying to recreate all these module models in high fidelity so basically if you have skills in modeling or texturing or anything uh, re regarding game development you could contribute as well we have a github repository where there you can find not just the vr uh, demo but you can also find a lot more projects such as uh, discord bot or uh, access management Basically, we have a team full of various uh, skills, uh, various people that have like so many skills on their, on their uh, tool chain. Now, I'll take a small opportunity to also say this uh, fact that I've been learning recently. 
I understand that NASA considers older people to be more uh, uh, capable to take radiation exposure simply because of the fact that the cancer does not have that much time to grow within their body. So basically, we should care a lot more about younger people because they have a long lifespan ahead and all these uh, mutations in their DNA can pile up and uh, create some problems later uh, down the road. Adrian, uh, before you continue, uh, someone, I think, uh, the Greenstone Movies uh, uh, told us uh, on the stream that uh, your voice, uh, though I can hear it well uh, on the stream on Discord, is not very audible uh, on the YouTube uh, stream. So uh, just uh, uh, if you talk uh, the next time, you might be able to fix the, the audio for your specific uh, voice. Absolutely. Thank you for the feedback. I'll try to fix this as well. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so that was about the uh, radiation uh, exposure. I think uh, schools in particular will have to uh, concern themselves a lot more with radiation exposure. So that's my two cents and I'll turn off the microphone. Yeah, um, I just want to match what Adrian said there, which is very, very important is we we are a we've got a very strong team at the moment. We've got uh, some very clever engineers and chemists, um, medical experts. We've got experts in quite a few fields, but we are far from um, having all the answers with everything. And we definitely need people uh, to help us uh, with a lot of things, especially if it's just come to do research. Because I mean, when I came and joined this project, the, what I thought a building would should look like on Mars and what, the, what we're designing now is very different because we, we learn so much. It's not, um, it's not a matter of, we don't expect people to, to come in and just have the answers. We, we expect people to come here and learn because that's what you're going to be doing. And we're learning in all different fields. I'm, I'm an architect. I'm learning about radiation now because these are problems that we don't have to solve on earth, but these are problems that you will absolutely have to solve, um, on Mars. So I definitely think if you want to learn and, um, experience new things are definitely worth uh, coming. Um, I just quickly want to finish up with uh, the topic of radiation is we've, we've got these four categories as Kunz mentioned before. Um, and the idea is that we have category one buildings, category two, three, and four buildings. And what the idea is that category one buildings are extremely radiation hardened, um, like the building that I've shown just now. And what this means that is a person's, their, their um, daily dosage. So this would be a category one building, for example, which is extremely well uh, shielded and no radiation will get inside. So the idea is that if you're in a category one building, you spend most of your day. This is where you work, this is where you um, sleep. This is where you do most of your day-to-day -day things. Your category two buildings are, um, we'll give you 10 times the radiation exposure. And I, we'd love it if somebody can help us do some additional research so that these question marks can actually be filled in. Um, these category uh, two buildings would be things like tunnels and walkways and um, the intermediate buildings where radiation protection, we know you're not gonna spend too much time there. Category three buildings are very lightly shielded. So these could be parks, um, these could be uh, activity spaces, but you're not going to spend, maybe you'll spend 10 hours there once a week kind of thing. And that's fine because that's not going to do anything to you. And then obviously category four is no shielding at all. Um, and sure. that's our approach. Yeah. Uh, before you continue to the, the next subject, uh, because I see you're already almost there. There was one question uh, by Mars Rover um, about um, the radiation protection. I will read it to you and maybe you can answer it. Um, Marge Rover asked on the YouTube stream, uh, does designing radiation resistant and pressure containing habitats limit building more than the lack of gravity enables larger buildings to be built? Ooh, can you just uh, ask that again? Because that's a, it's an interesting question, I think. Yeah. Uh, does designing radiation resistance and pressure containing habitats limit building more than the lack of gravity enables larger buildings to be built. So it's like, like a trade-off, as I read the question, a yeah. trade-off between the gravity, uh, which is, uh, of course, about a third uh, compared to Earth, uh, which gives us a lot of uh, 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 yeah, uh, more options uh, in design, 
um, but this radiation protection uh, and uh, pressure habit, pressurized uh, atmospheres that we need to create, uh, are they more limiting? And, and how does this relate uh, to one another? It's an interesting question. And I don't think we should see it in terms of limiting. It's different. It's absolutely different. We can build taller buildings on Mars um, than we would be able to do on Earth, even with radiation. So a kilometer tall building on Mars, piece of cake. Like, it's really, really easy. Um, and I've really done some calculations. The, I've, I've done quite a bit of math trying to figure out what's possible. I'm going to just pop a uh, building on here in a second. I just quickly want to find it over here. Um, so this building that I'm sure a lot of you have already seen is a landmark building that I've designed. And this, just to give you an idea, is a 300 uh, and 80 meter tall building. Now, on Earth, this structure does not exist. We cannot build this building on Earth. Why? Because if you see those tubes, they're held up by air pressure, which means that this building can practically not exist on Earth unless we uh, build a highly pressurized system. And then we have to find ways to get inside this building, which, which you won't want to do because it means that you're going to have to go through pressurization techniques and uh, decompressurization when you leave. Uh, so we can build things on Earth that we cannot, uh, things on Mars that we cannot build on Earth. So to see it as a limitation, it's different. Don't see it as a limitation. We have to think differently. And this is the, one of the most important things that we have to consider. Yes, we have radiation protection, so we have to have thicker things, but you don't have to have radiation protection everywhere. Yes, pressure vessels are a problem, but that can be an advantage. So um, uh, you can think of it a balloon can stand upright all by itself. Uh, if you take one of these uh, party balloons and you inflate it, it will stand upright all by itself. And a lot of structures would do that on Mars. There'll be like little pressure containers that can stand upright by themselves. But if you took the pressure outside, that balloon just becomes a little floppy thing that lies on the ground. What we have on Earth is floppy little things that lie on the ground and we have to build, we have to fight gravity on Earth. That's what we have to fight. On Mars, fighting gravity is not really our thing. That's not really the big problem there. So we have to fight other forces. So it's a different way of thinking. Um, so I really don't want people to think of it as a limitation, because if you think of it as a limitation, it means that you're comparing structures on Mars to structures on Earth. And um, that's actually what we need to get away from. We need to think of how to build on Mars separately to how to build on Earth. These are two different questions. I hope that answers his question. Okay, so um, yeah, I'm going to just uh, finish off um, radiation. And this is the, the last, really the last thing that we need to, to answer and talk about in terms of buildings. I see there's also the streams getting long. Um, and then if you want to, I can, I can showcase just one building and, and show how we got there. The last issue we need to talk about, which, which is very important for designing, is energy. Um, on Earth, we are we have uh, lots of energy to make materials, and energy is our primary source where we're going to get materials from. We need to melt steel, and we have to get the energy from that. Um, and uh, every single product we make has to ha has got a history of energy. So, on Earth, we've got oil, and we are built with oil because what oil is it's stored energy from the sun for 10,000 years before or 100,000 million years before it's stored energy and we are taking the stored energy and we're using it in condensed form and things like polymers and plastics are stored energy that we're just taking a small part of the process uh, to make plastics most of the work's been done on Mars we have first have to make what's essentially oil and then we have to convert it into plastics 10% of the work is taking it from plastic, from oil to plastic. The 90% of the work is done already on Earth. On Mars, we have to do that 90%. So we have to think differently about energy and a lot of things we have to work harder for to be more careful. So um, structures like this that you often see with these massive polymer domes and things, they are possible. Um, you can imagine these thick walls, a 21 centimeter thick plastic wall will be able to hold the internal pressures in a, in a three meter radius um, uh, habitat, like this one on the bottom right, easily. But the energy requirements to make that plastic is immense. It's, you, could, you could make about 20, 30 times more things out of steel than out of plastics. 
So we have to be careful with that. Plastics are really good for radiation protection because they've got a lot of hydrogen atoms in them. But um, I mean, I've, we've done the calculations and if you look at one millimeter of HDPE, which is essentially a polymer, needs uh, what 10 times more energy than uh, a basalt fiber fabric. And I did these calculations. Uh, this basalt fiber fabric is 10% plastic. That 0.2 is the basalt fiber. That's how much energy it'll take to make the basalt fiber. The 10 comes from the plastics, the polymers. So polymers are highly energy intensive. Um, we can at later stage find ways, better ways to make plastics. For example, growing algae, where we get the energy from the sun, which is free, which means we don't have to build solar panels and nuclear reactors. And this is a much more intelligent way of tackling it. And I think we have to look at that a lot more in detail. Um, steel is available on Mars. It's not that bad. It's better than plastics, but it's still something we have to consider. And this is just some, this is just the reality of building on Mars. Um, the last thing I want to touch on in terms of energy on Mars is we are where you are sitting right now, you're radiating energy off through, through black, what they call black body radiation. And if you had to pick up an infrared camera and look at things around you, you'll, what you're seeing is the, the radiation being radiated off you. And that's energy that's always leaving you every second of the minute. Um, so on Mars, uh, a body at, at, at about 20 degrees Celsius is radiating full time. It's radiating off about 400 watts a square meter. Now that's a lot because the average, so not the peak or the lowest, the average energy that we're going to receive from the sun at our location, which is 38 degrees south, is 450 watts per square meter during the day. At night, it's zero or close to zero. So we need to be, we need to either constantly warm our habitats or we have to radiate that heat back. That 450 watts, we can actually bring it back into our habitats by reflecting it. Um, we had this discussion not too long ago where we talked about um, smart materials that can actually reflect, that allows light to come in and reflects the energy back in. Now on Earth, we do this to, to we call these low E glass on Earth. Um, and the idea is that we want to keep our buildings cool because glass makes, we don't want all our buildings to be greenhouses, we get too hot. On Mars, we're going to do the opposite. We want to trap the heat as much as possible and create greenhouses. Um, we've got some very smart people over here that, that are busy working on different materials. Um, I know the Lomi chemist, he's, he's given me some suggestions. Uh, Elizabeth May has given us some suggestions of materials that we can use. Um, I've suggested early on, uh, this was one of my early ideas, this pictures at the bottom of our farms, where we have a reflective membrane that can slide over on the farms during the day, uh, sorry, at night. And these reflective barriers then reflect heat back in. Uh, and during the day, they pull back to, to uh, expose the clear uh, farm material uh, below so that they can warm up again. So these are problems we can solve. Sean, uh, yeah. just um, one uh, question specifically related to um, uh, this, I think, um, on the YouTube stream. Uh, Low Rats asks, uh, can't we easily concentrate incoming sunlight with mylar type materials? Um, I think I know the answer, but uh, you can uh, give it. Um, well, <laughs> the first thing that we, we need to be careful with is the material we use. We need to be careful what we use. Um, I naively thought that we could use uh, aluminum uh, film to reflect sunlight in because aluminum is very common. But aluminum likes to become aluminum oxide, and there's a lot of oxygen uh, atoms in the soil all over the place. It's highly acidic. So your aluminum is going to combine it. I don't know too much uh, about mylar. Um, yes, we can reflect sun, and we've actually thought about using some of our craters to line the outer sides of the craters with uh, reflective material and have the farms on the inside so that we can get more sunlight. The fact is actually though, in, in summer, we get enough sunlight. We, we don't actually have a problem with sunlight. Our biggest issue is actually losing heat. 
in winter, we are going to have to look at techniques like capturing more sunlight and reflecting it. This is a big problem. In uh, sure. Our one, uh, one thing about the question was, I think, uh, specifically about concentrating uh, incoming sunlight. Um, so there are materials that could do that, um, but maybe I could answer a little bit as well. Uh, I feel that um, looking at the structure that, uh, that Sean is showing, uh, like a farmland, would be also a giant air mattress like structure that we have talked about uh, before um, the concentration of sunlight would would uh, occur above this uh, and con concentrating sunlight requires a, a, a bigger area first to concentrate the light on a smaller area um, so uh, it might be able uh, to, to work with this and I think uh, it is actually, while I think about it, an interesting discussion, uh, but not exactly with this kind of farm uh, design uh, because it has such a large uh, um, uh, building volume and also surface area uh, that the way that we would need to concentrate more sunlight into this is to build on top of that much higher and a much wider structure to concentrate the light. Um, because you want to have, of course, more uh, solar energy to concentrate. Um, what would be uh, an interesting possibility is now, uh, now that I think about this question a bit more, is that um, if we would uh, be in the early phases uh, working with uh, more uh, smaller farmland, um, we could actually uh, try out uh, ways to concentrate sunlight, uh, maybe by reflection, as Sean has talked about, or maybe even this... Uh, mylar type uh, material. Uh, so uh, Laura Lowretz, or however I pronounce your, your name, uh, thank you for the suggestion. And uh, we will uh, discuss this uh, in one of the Discord channels uh, for maybe the early phases of colonization. Thank you. Yeah, re reflecting, reflecting light in, especially during winter, has a lot of benefits. Um, but the, these are difficult questions and, and we really have to dig deep into answering a lot of questions because sometimes things that sound like they're the best answer, we, they end up becoming a little bit more difficult. Um, I do think reflecting light into farms is a benefit, but the problem is you, you take up more surface area at another space. So the question is, would that surface area be better off with another farm? Could we grow more in the same area or with less energy because energy is one of the top questions, can we grow more um, without using a reflective surface? Uh, and and there's a, these are a lot of things that we don't have the answers to. So on Earth, we generally don't uh, need to solve these problems. This is, uh, these, are, these are questions that we're asking that almost nobody has ever had needed to ask before. So we are, we're, with a lot of these topics, we're, we're going blind, but we are trying our best. Um, yeah, this is this is most of the uh, what I prepared to talk about. Um, I don't know if anybody's got more questions. What I can do after this, if we still have time, because I know this talk has taken quite a long time already, um, is I can go through one of the structures that I've built. Sorry, let me go find this one. Um, and just kind of to put all these things together, explain how these things, how these different problems come together into actually a building itself. Um, uh, Sean, uh, I, I would really like you to do that. Um, uh, first, um, I would like to give uh, the other uh, people on our Discord uh, live uh, chat uh, or live video conference, actually, um, a chance to maybe also talk a little bit about their projects. And uh, then we will uh, go back to your um, uh, structural design. And I would also like to ask you, uh, your Google Sheets, uh, Google Slide presentation, uh, would be able to share this as well uh, publicly, uh, because uh, that would actually be interesting for a lot of people, I feel. And uh, if we can add it uh, to the YouTube stream, or at least uh, uh, add it to the description, maybe, uh, that would be really worthwhile. Uh, I think uh, for all people listening, uh, so they can also browse through your nice presentation themselves. Um, so with that said, um, I'm actually going to give the word uh, uh, first now to uh, Ignis Kogitare, if I pronounce that correctly. Um, so uh, open your mic and maybe explain something about specifically what you are working on in the Nexus Aurora project. 
Hello, so I'm Ignis, and what I'm currently working on is the LIFE protocols, uh, livelihood and in infrastructure, facilities, and equipment. I'm working on human rating, essentially. I'm working so that all of our, our machines, our habitats, our orbital station, everything is a consistently safe and healthy place for our astronauts to live. So I'm establishing a set of universal protocols that must be followed everywhere so that not only is there safety, but there's consistency in safety and safety mechanisms. Because if it's not consistent, you may go from one place to another. And if you're familiar with one safety mechanism and it's different somewhere else, then you'll go for the safety mechanism you're used to. It won't be there. And quite frankly, you'll die or, or, or get injured. It's not going to be good. So I'm making sure that safety mechanisms, all of that works exactly the same everywhere and that everywhere is safe or as safe as it can be considering we're thousands of kilometers away from our home planet on a small rock with little atmosphere. Yes, uh, thank you so much for sharing that, uh, Ignis. Um, uh, yeah, you see the broad, the, the 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 amount of uh, projects that we are that we are working on uh, together with all of all of these different specialties, specializations. Um, yeah, it's it's really uh, really really nice to see. Uh, thank you, Ignis, uh, for sharing uh, what you are working on. Um, Kelvin, uh, the bot master, uh, can you explain uh, what your role is at this moment in the Nexus Aurora project? I think uh, Kelvin has maybe a mic problem. I will ask him uh, later. Um, I can speak now the question is: I, I can Ah, you can hear oh. me because we had yeah, a yeah. meeting. <laughs> so basically, we had a long, uh, actually quite fast growth period. Uh, we managed to gather around 350 to 400, something like this, uh, on the Discord server. And basically, one of the issues emerging is that a lot of people uh, are uh, a bit. Uh, uh, and uh, overwhelmed by the amount of projects that we have here. So um, the bot is supposed to help with uh, finding your way around and also promoting people that are very active in the project. So we will be able to uh, quickly figure out who is actually doing uh, useful work in a certain domain and then we can uh, kind of um, remind him that there are certain uh, documents where we can uh, publish this or we can um, take uh, opportunity and uh, publish this work on uh, social media. So basically the bot will help with all these operations. And we figured out that a custom solution is far better than something that is uh, available on the market uh, as a pre-made solution. Thanks for sharing that, um, Adrian, uh, space instructor, I should say, for all the people watching online and uh, from Reddit. Um, next, I would like to ask uh, Ellie the Dude, um, the 3D printing guru, what uh, he's working on in Nexus Aurora. And can you shortly describe that in about a minute? All right, thank you. Um, so we've been working on 3D printing all the designs that our team has been coming up with. Uh, and it's important to 3D print these things that we can prototype and make sure that everything is going to work the way it needs to that when we bring it and we actually start building them on Mars, we actually know what we're doing and we can overcome some of the obstacles that we might face. Um, we're also working on some social media content. So we're working on a time lapse for a pocket. Um, so be on the watch out for that. Uh, I'm also helping uh, building the bot and programming it. Okay, Ali, that's uh, really great. Uh, thanks uh, for doing all of this uh, work uh, and uh, thanks for explaining uh, to all the viewers and listeners uh, what, what that is uh, and how you are contributing. Thank you so much. Um, May Elizabeth, um, yeah, yesterday uh, you were also uh, in a lively discussion. Uh, can you explain our viewers uh, what uh, your specialty is and uh, how your involvement in Nexus Aurora is uh, helping uh, make humans a multiplanetary species? 
Okay, I am the active director of the production domain. So I'm in charge of making sure that uh, everything that is needed to uh, ensure civilization runs smoothly is available. And primarily what I've been working on is the production of um, petroleum-like chemicals such as uh, naphthalene and uh, benzene, toluene, uh, xylenes, those sorts of things are able to be produced so that plastics and fuels can be available uh, on these other planets uh, to be produced and not have to be imported. So uh, a lot of my work so far has been with uh, designing or um, working on implementing and discovering catalysts to uh, proceed with those reactions. Uh, I am an organic chemist, so that's where um, most of my uh, experience is here. Thank you so much for sharing that um, with us, uh, lonely chemist uh, May Elizabeth. Um, Sam, mm -hmm. uh, can you maybe uh, also uh, share um, your uh, specific uh, um, things you're working on in the Nexus Aurora project? I'm not sure if Sam can hear me or his mic is working. Um, so I think for now, let me take a look. Uh, yeah, I, I would like to ask a certified uh, default uh, to maybe give a quick introduction in what he has been up to uh, within the Next Aurora project. Go ahead, uh, certified default. I cannot hear you. Uh, maybe someone else can. It might be my connection, but uh, can you maybe try again uh, to connect your mic uh, certified default? Okay. Um, I don't know for sure uh, if it is my audio, but it seems uh, like uh, it does not work. Um, so I will ask Sam one more time, and if uh, Sam uh, cannot respond, we'll uh, go back to Sean um, uh, to show some of the things that he's working on. Ah, I think I hear certified default now. Can you uh, yeah. please uh, give us an introduction? Okay, so I'm certified default. I am the leader of the mining group, or one of the leads. So our job is to find and extract any valuable minerals or resources that we can from the ground. Um, we're currently using JMARS as one of our softwares, and um, that is a map of where we think iron may be located. And after we find potential places, we're going to start working on the hardware of the robots and how we're going to find it. That's great and very important, uh, like all of these different projects. Uh, I'm going to give uh, Sam uh, the last word to uh, explain something about his project before we go back to Sean. Uh, I, I'm sorry, I just got a message from uh, Sam that uh, he can't uh, talk on stream right now. So. Um, uh, Sean, uh, Manias Wolf, uh, you're, you have been showing us uh, on the stream a lot of your uh, designs. Uh, one of the questions um, in uh, the YouTube stream um, was from uh, No Limit in the Space. And he's asking about what kind of applications uh, you use for all of these simulations. Uh, I guess we're looking at Blender right now, as most people can see. But uh, maybe you can uh, explain a little bit about all the other uh, stuff that you have been uh, showing us uh, tonight. Yeah, so I've been, this is Blender. Uh, I think a lot of people know the software and for anybody that's interested in, that they would like to get into 3D modeling and they're too scared or think it's too expensive or complicated, this is the go-to software. It, uh, I've been using Blender for a month and a half and it got me this far where it taught me a lot of these um, models and it is mostly useful to to produce very good 
quick conceptual stuff for me. For a lot of people, that can go a lot further and create more detail. But this allows me to very quickly create a, a situation where I can visualize, okay, this is what we're going to do, and I can change things quite quickly. So this is this is a great software, and anybody that's got like even a small interest in modeling things in 3D, you should just spend oh, one hour a day. There's a, I, I, I really learned this very quickly. So this is Blender. This is Rhino, which um, which is a different type of application. It's actually, I, I don't know it very well yet. I'm busy trying to learn it because of its algorithmic design potential. Now, um, this is algorithmic design or generative design is, this is a very simple thing. This is that where I showed earlier, where we can try and um, make different structures very quickly because uh, from that image that Kun showed, this is like the air mattress design. And here we can very quickly, um, I can do quite things, but I can do more complicated things with this as well. So this is, this is what I like to use over here. Um, and my big reasoning why I use this is I want to create nodes. Uh, let me see if I can get Grasshopper working. Nope. Grasshopper does not want to show itself today. Um, but essentially what, what nodes are is it allows me to program things in. And ultimately, my idea is that I can start working on programming how our city is going to work. So we want to have a city of a million people. We can't build every single house, but through software, I can create an algorithm that can start generating houses and we can start looking at how this is going to look in our city. Um, I'm well along my way with that, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done before I can show how that's exactly going to work. Um, what other software do I use? I use um, my architectural program. This is Archicad, which I use to generate uh, my CAD drawings. It can also do 3D work, but because it likes to um, likes to design buildings for Earth, which are all two-dimensional structures, it doesn't like um, these funny curves as much, and it's a bit slower if I do that. So um, I can finish a building off, but this is what I use for that. But I use a lot of other things. I use, geez, I don't know. Uh, I've been using Google Earth Pro, which is um, which is free to everybody as well, um, just to get an idea of how the cities work. I, I don't know. I use a lot of software. I use whatever I can find, and uh, I'm here to learn. And so I'm always learning something new. Thanks uh, for that, uh, Sean. Uh, um, before we really conclude, uh, could you? Uh, Quickly take a um, take a tour through the building that you've just been showing us in Rhino 3D um, and explain some of the principles that we have been talking about during this stream and how you have uh, used them to create uh, this nice design. Right. So um, I'm going to start switching layers off, um, and the the most important thing we need to think is all these different principles we've been talking about the whole time. So the very first principle we've been talking about are domes and cylinders. And you'll see this is the first one that I've been working on is essentially five different uh, tubes that are combined together. And in these points, there'll be a structure that pulls this point and this point together, like those girder structures that we showed in the farmlands. They'll also on top, you'll see there's a little inverted um, like, it, uh, like a funnel, but what it is, is it pulls from the top to the bottom so that the dome doesn't extend so high, because if it's very high, your hull structure has to go higher. So we're pulling the structure in to make it a bit more, um, make it a bit more sense so that we can have um, the start of the building and every building needs to start somewhere. That's what it looks like from the side, but this will be a mixture probably of a polymer um, a clear polymer and a basalt fiber netting so that it'd be a strong structure to get an idea of what it looks like. We're going to have to dig a hole in the ground for it because it's a big structure. And this is where you can see the benefits of lifting it up because otherwise we, that's just a little bit of soil we can dig out, but, uh, we can probably move it higher above the ground as well if you want to. Um, but this gives us a structure where you can enter horizontally against the side from the ground level. Then we want to start adding the structural elements. Um, 
And this structural element's got big holes in the side. I want as much light as possible. But this is for the radiation proofing. And you're asking me, you know, what's the point of these little holes if I want radiation proofing? Because this is supposed to be a school for children. So what I'm going to do here is um, actually fill the the sides. Maybe I can show you better because it's uh, a bit difficult there. I'm going to fill these with water. So you'll have water that runs up the full length inside those uh, gaps. So this then starts to be clear so that as soon as you start adding the floors, you can see how the people will have access to more light. On top, we will have to have water, which is these parts over here. Um, so Rhino is not the best software for, for rendering and there are better ways to do it. I'm still fairly new, otherwise I would show nicer, sexier looking renders, but this shows the principles. So on top, you'll be able to have water as well, so that you'll be able to see through the top. And um, right on top, we'll, we'll have a uh, tent, um, this structure over here, which keeps the water inside the building. So all these different structures work together because um, this water creates our radiation proofing and it allows a lot of light through. So it's got double purpose. We can also see outside. Children are supposed to be here and we want our kids to be happy. Um, we don't want a depressing environment. The top of here, because of this dome tent, um, we can actually add a little bit of pressure and create a giant swimming pool for kids on top. Um, and then we've got multiple floors that we have inside. Each floor is four meters high because on Mars we've got less gravity and I'm only guessing that the children are all going to want to jump and touch the ceiling. Um, and a structure like this, we also at the bottom have a place where the services will be able to be and um, maybe put all the naughty kids when, when they like the teachers too much. So yeah, this is essentially how all these different things that I've spoken about come together in a structure. And it's, it's not as much limiting. This looks like a Gothic cathedral, if, if you recognize those buildings. And it does so because of the, the structural requirements that Mars needs. These aren't artificial add-ons. These aren't nothing but aesthetics. They are a combination of all the different uh, techniques that I've talked about and what is the basic necessities for building on Mars. So we can build nice structures on Mars. We can do a lot of interesting things. Uh, there aren't limitations, there are differences. So yeah, that's pretty much what I have to show. Okay, that's very nice, uh, Sean. Um, I see one question specifically about that uh, from uh, Flex. Uh, he's asking, uh, so 16 meter of water column, uh, then uh, you're going to need some strong windows. Uh, can you maybe explain why uh, that might not be a big problem? Because it's uh, an interesting question, because if you look from an Earth's uh, perspective, uh, it seems very logical to assume that uh, uh, a water column of, uh, in this case, uh, 16 meters uh, would require massive windows uh, to uh, be held back. Can you maybe explain why this, um, in our view, is not uh, the problem uh, that we face on Mars? Yes. So, well, the first thing you need to think about is on Earth, um, a 10 meter column of water will push down at the bottom at 100,000 uh, 100, kilonewtons. So that'll create one bar of pressure for every 10 meters of water you go up. This is, as you correctly said, this is 16 meters, it's actually a little bit higher. So at the bottom here, we'll have 101 kilopascals of pressure and glass will have to be quite strong. On Mars, things are a little bit different. Um, first of all, we've got the internal pressure that is pushing outwards. So this wall on the inside will have to keep the, the glass inside from pushing out, from shooting outwards. Uh, this will probably be a polymer opposed to glass. So that's the biggest pressure, actually, because we've got a third of the gravity. We've got, uh, on Earth, we've got 9.8 meters um, per second gravity. Mars, we've got 3.7. So the same column of water can go three times higher on Mars before it builds up the same pressures. So you'll find that the thick material I use on the building, on a structure like this, would be on the inside to hold out the internal pressures. The outer glass can actually be a lot thinner 
because it actually needs to only hold back equivalent of three and a half meters of water, not t uh, or per 10 meters. So over here it will be say about five meters of water. So there's a big difference. Um, and uh, we still need to obviously consider these things. A building like this still would be very expensive to build because of all the materials and polymers. And But if things are different on Mars, we're going to have to build with uh, different ways. And uh, that's why we, re we eliminate, we we'll reduce how much clear material we use, but um, it's possible. So this. Yeah, Sean, and, uh, and, uh, and also uh, this question why it's also maybe interesting in the design itself. It could also be um, uh, remedied uh, by creating uh, sort of sections within the column uh, on the floor level height, uh, maybe. Um, so you have like multiple pill shaped vertical windows. Uh, so uh, you don't have a 16 meter water column and that might uh, even make this design um, use less material, but still have a lot of light coming in uh, on each floor. So it's an, actually an interesting suggestion. And what I, uh, before we really conclude, uh, would like to uh, mention is um, that these kinds of questions are very important uh, because uh, and and I don't know uh, if uh, Plex uh, is in this case, uh, for example, a structural engineer or maybe he's just interested in the project. Um, but anyone can ask these questions. We are open source uh, space colonization project Nexus Aurora. Um, and uh, as you have hopefully seen during this uh, first stream that we have tried out and we are learning as we go. Uh, we have tried to answer all of the questions that uh, people have been asking us uh, publicly on the YouTube uh, chat uh, function. Um, if you want to visit us on uh, Reddit, uh, you can go to uh, 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 slash r slash Nexus Aurora. Um, and if you are yourself very interested in the project and would like to contribute yourself and be a part of our Discord channel, um, please uh, send a message on Reddit to... Uh, uh, space instructor, uh, he's going to wave now to you, uh, and uh, there he is, and um, he can send you the invite uh, to the Discord channel, and uh, you can uh, see all of the things that we have got going on and contribute in whatever way uh, you like. I'm actually going to read uh, some of the different themes that we have, so you might get an idea of what you could contribute uh, to the project, or make your own new uh, project if you really have a good idea. So, for example, we have um, uh, in administration, we got uh, government, diplomacy, education, judicial system, privacy and human rights and disaster prevention. Uh, in buildings, we got, oh, sorry, I forgot emergency services. Uh, in the architecture and building, um, we got regolith houses, modular houses and interior designs. In e economics, we got uh, market economy and services. Um, in equipment, we got multi-purpose multi robotics, spacesuit design, and uh, human rating. In infrastructure, we got uh, orbital station, satellites network, and outdoor engineering. In logistics, we got landing zones, access management, colony bootstrapping, standardization, and supply chains. And just to, as a reminder, all of these groups have a lot of people working on them and discussing specifically how we can solve the problems in this case also for example in medical facilities uh, medicine production and medical services um, specifically also production uh, of steel and farming and polymers mining goods uh, biopetrochems uh, and uh, distillery even uh, is uh, there these are all separate projects that uh, you could uh, sign up for and uh, also take part in the discussion or even design stuff. Uh, in the transport area, we got orbital lander, railroads, surface rover and uh, launch complex. And we're almost there, but there's, there's a lot of projects as you can hear. Uh, in urban planning, we got uh, transport corridors, landmarks and city layout. Um, in utilities, we got water recovery, air re revitalization, power generation, which is also vital of course, and recycling. And then we have a lot of groups um, uh, who are working on 3D assets, rendering, printing, um, and uh, the graphics that we uh, will need to present to create our final presentation uh, for the competition. That's a 20-page document that we need to hand in uh, for this uh, 
one million person colony uh, for Mars that we need to create uh, for um, the Mars Society's uh, competition that will end uh, at the end of this month. Um, I would also like to add that all of these projects that I've been talking, sorry, talking about um, are yeah, being made possible by all of these people uh, on the Discord server uh, and uh, from uh, and and what I would like to add as well is just to name some countries uh, uh, that people who contribute to this content uh, are working from. And that's, for example, Cuba, the USA, Romania, the Netherlands, South Africa, India, Switzerland, uh, Argentina, um, and a lot more countries that I cannot remember at this moment. But the interesting thing is that we all work online, of course, uh, virus proof uh, from our homes uh, together on this uh, really cool uh, platform. And um, you could contribute too. Uh, even only following us on the different social media platforms that we have and Reddit uh, would be great. Um, of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel uh, and you, uh, if you ring the bell, and uh, you, you will be notified the next time that we have a stream like this and you can join live again and we can answer all of your questions again. So um, I'm going to ask if anyone uh, from our uh, Nexus Aurora team has anything to add before I conclude. Uh, and otherwise, I would at least uh, from my point uh, like to thank all the people who have uh, joined the stream um, and especially uh, Sean uh, Manius Wolf who has uh, provided us with such a nice presentation and uh, nice visuals of all the things that uh, he and others have designed for this uh, Nexus Aurora colony that we're working on uh, together. So is there anyone uh, who would like to add uh, anything to this? No, thank you, Kun. Um, thank you for, for uh, mediating or almost running this meeting. Um, I, I think it's been quite productive and if anybody has questions at any time, uh, we're, we're always sitting and we actually respond quite quick and got a lot of people that are very clued up at the moment. So if you have questions, just ask them and uh, you can get involved as quickly as possible. That would be great. Yes, I completely agree. Um, we are very open, uh, as you have noticed uh, during this stream. Um, I feel that a lot of people have watched it and a lot of comments have been made. Uh, people from Reddit have showed up and have asked questions. We have tried to answer most, uh, uh, actually all of them. Um, and uh, yeah, it uh, really gives a great feeling that so many people are interested uh, in uh, what we're doing from outside of Nexus Aurora, which is already a great team uh, and a large amount of people. Uh, so again, uh, please uh, follow us uh, anywhere you like on social media, Reddit, or here, of course, on YouTube, and uh, we'll see you in the next uh, stream. Thanks for hosting uh, Space Instructor Adrian, uh, and uh, we'll do this again uh, in the future. Thanks. Thank you.